over soon it. after. Here we go. All right, Darren, what do you got? Well, I was here to. Oh, you're right, Ontario. See what Terry's plans are. Explain how that whole trash system works. <laughs> Explain why we pay a tipping fee. Explain what the trash service does for our landfill. Because I don't have a clue. The trash service, are you talking about the tipping fee that we pay? Yes. For the CMB landfill? No, no, for, no the, for the county. To Reno County. Reno County. That was before this time, too. That was something that was written in the original agreement that the county would pay that tipping fee. Which is thirty-one dollars a ton for trash that like Stafford County trash hauls in there. That's what. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. And the are, are you wondering why we have to pay? Yeah, it? I don't understand. Either we someone, would have to pay it, or it could be passed on, and the hauler would pay it, right? Right. Yeah. Most counties, as I understand, the haulers pay it. The county gets totally out of it. I, I can't understand. I can't get the picture of why of what we do for the in our trash service contract why we're even involved exactly i mean well, that's that's yeah. what i can't get figured and out I, amongst this whole deal and i'd like to have some knowledge before our meeting next tuesday night um you see that's my question is our why is the county responsible for the trash service right did years ago didn't the county have the trash service that's way before you well, see that, but and I don't know it. From what I, I mean, from 1976, I mean we we had MSW pits at the landfill, right. and it was all done in house. Mm -hmm. But when uh, when the state required put MSW in the ground, we had to have the line pit, right? And that'd be 1990. Mm -hmm. 1991, um, they went, the county went to C and D only <clears throat> to get away from the cost of, mm -hmm. of the line pit, and, which is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So it all started going to Reno County, which has a line pit. And uh, of course, that was before my time. Um, well, if you read those minutes, I mean, Bob Wellman was on the trash board when he started it off. Mm -hmm. Kevin and Gerald and that's why Terry wanted you to have that contract, the minutes, yeah. so you kind of got an idea of the history he had. That was before Terry did anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was just a deal that Bob Wellman set up for him. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I remember Terry, when all that it's just happened. I mean, I remember forward. when when all that happened, but I, I mean, but there's the only thing I can see as to why the county is involved with the tipping fee. Is apparently, I mean, the only thing I can see as an advantage is, is financial assurance. You know, I mean, uh, to say if, if, if the hauler is responsible for paying for the, the tipping fee, would he pay the bill and all of a sudden? Well, that's what you're Well, he's got to. Yes, but if he's got a contract basically with all the people he's got on his route. Yeah. yeah. In essence. But if they fall behind and they stop taking waste and they don't know where to go with it, then it just piles up in people's house. So, I mean, yeah. I think all this happened before. I mean, that's the only we way we're going to have to Reno County. County. Sure. So, yeah. my guess is when they said, okay, now we got a hold of Reno County, they did, probably would just decided that, hey, the Why county will pay cost? you, since the county can't dispose of it themselves, the county won't have to, will pay the tipping fee. Uh, and we'd already agreed to that 23000 deal to supplement the trash hauling before that. Yeah, I mean, it's two, two different right. fees that we're paying for, really. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, pay the, we pay mileage on top of the tipping fee, right? No. For, no. Yeah. Really? For, yeah. for Nively and, well, it's, 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 what's the other one? Chisholm. Chisholm. Yeah, we pay them. Okay, all the mileage. Is it per ton or is it a mile? Whatever it is. It's, I don't know what I it is. It's like mileage. Yeah. So, are we required by the Kansas statute to provide trash service? Are the county commissioners obligated to provide trash service 
for the county and the residents in the county? Or is it, uh, you know, when I find all that, that's what was, the, what was going on at Ford County, you know, when they put in the new debt. And the county operates the pit, correct? Mm -hmm. Same way with Pratt County. The county operates the landfill. So in and, Ford and County, does the county pick up the trash? Or well, that's what I don't know. I was in the impression that it's... Because uh, I know the county did when they were taking it. The, the independents that were bringing in, and they paid the tipping fee. Is that be a general question? Um, does the city of Hutchinson have their own trash service? Does the city operate their trash service? Or are they have independent body members? I think I think to take care of them. Well, the end result is, is it's the consumer or the customer that has, is paying for the trash service. I don't think it's fair that each city water meter in the city of St. John, I believe Maxwell is the same way, I don't know about Stafford, that you pay a trash service off your city bill. Yeah. And in a roundabout way, we're taxing for the same service. Mm -hmm. I just... We're in the middle of that. I don't know, yeah, I, I can't figure out why we're even involved. I mean, well, and, and, and if we can totally get away from the tipping fee it would be and right. reduce, if, if that reduces your budget... Reduce it a lot, wouldn't it? Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. if we could figure out this well, mileage deal... Well, Ultimately, it's going to come back to the consumer paying for their own trash service. And that's what it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The only problem I can see with that, but what if somebody decides instead of paying $16 a month, it's 25 and I can't do that? Well, right now. You mean in the cities? Yeah. Right now, it's hiring that group. What is it now? It's like 30. It's like 30, 20 to 30. Okay, well, it's going to increase, though. Yeah. So what if they just well, decide I can't do it? Well, not according to what Well, see. Price the city builds that on their bill, mm -hmm. and then the city would So they build. have no choice. Right. It comes on your bill. Okay. I can't figure out why the cities would even want I don't know why the county's would well, involved. It's all, I mean, wherever you go, it's the all trash the, service yeah. is tied to, to the, the city bill. Yeah. Well, it's a lot easier for them to send the bills out because they're oh, sending yeah. them anyway. That way, you, they don't give you any choice as to whether you participate. Yeah. It's just like the sewer fee is tied to the amount of gallons of water that is used. Could I get a copy of Marvin's proposal? Do you have any? No, don't have one. We don't really have one. We didn't, because we don't know what he's quoting. I mean, he's and he doesn't know what he's quoting. Yeah. That's basically the just kind of we're trying to figure out that's how this whole thing is working. They want to get out of that game. We want to figure out. I think that would be better. We, I think we want to figure out if we have to, by law, do something. And if we do, what's that going to cost? Or if we can wash our hands of it, and why do we even need to be involved? Mm -hmm. yeah, basically, each city decides for themselves who they want to have they pick up their trash. They do that, they anyway. Do that anyway. But we, are, we won't supplement them for the tipping fee, and we won't supplement them for whatever that little $23,000 oh, sure. bonus was. Yeah. That was, that was oh. in the 20, 20, or the year contract 20 years ago. Which is now coming up, and that way, it, I mean, it'd be fair to everybody. Yeah. I mean, Terry would have to bid um, against nicely, nicely. I mean, it's just they're all on the same level playing field. Exactly. You know, we need to get something that's concrete, like with the dumpsters we have. At one time, I had it was contracted in the contract. Two dumpsters to be dumped daily at the plant. As long as I've been there, of course, we did add. We added two more. But I can never recall a daily service. I mean, it was weak. But yet, we had two dumpsters. Right. I mean, four instead of two. 
But now you don't have any out there. Now I don't have any. Because there's C&D. And, you know, and that was for one county yard. And now we have... And there's one here. Now we have three. Yeah, but it's the That's much. I use one at the recycle building. Mm -hmm. And it's not weekly. And then the uh, road department has two. two. That was one thing that Nisley did propose was if he did the city pickup, that he would do the single stream recycling too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's something that we are. Yeah, asked Harry if he's even interested in doing that. Well, see, I talked to him. He wouldn't be single stream. I thought it said it was. He'd have two dumpsters. Well, yeah. two dumpsters. Or two containers. Two containers. Single stream is you dump everything together and yeah. then they separate. Right. That takes so you, you have one, one, one for two recycle, cars in one each for, house. for trash. Right. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not single stream. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, one for recycle. Yeah. One. I've already called it that, though. I thought he did too. Well, I mean, if you look. Terminology single stream is everything's done together. together and then it's gone so and then separated. Whereas, which most cities do, that's, that's the biggest, that's the yeah. biggest, uh, and and figure out time factor for me is getting it sorted. Did we figure out uh, our contract for the grant? Or We're fine with that. It, it expired in eight, okay. it'll be a five year deal. Well, that would free up labor too. I mean, it's a lot of his time. Yeah. yeah. See, I, when when I was looking into that single stream, um, cost wise, I mean, we were bringing in last year. Uh, we're looking at about sixty eight hundred dollars revenue from recycling, mm -hmm. and the cost is fifty it's fifty some hundred in expenditure. So, so it's not a big deal. No, it's, not a big, it's a great big service, service, but not a yeah. And I think this would take care of you know, our e waste if we go to a bill and what I've just some kind of recent. Morgan was talking about monthly picking up appliances. Mm -hmm. I mean, you drive to Alex and Taylor, you'd be surprised at but even. Really nice looking place. We just got one to sit in behind the garage and you know, waiting for that one day. You know. Well, and then, of course, what he was proposing would be curbside, so there wouldn't be any alley pickup. And I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to bring up you guys. I'm going to have to look into getting the uh, radiation detector, maybe. Uh, you can get a handheld one for a or something like that. Last uh, load of iron I had to go out. Um, P Bone bails that and markets it and pays us for it. But he had one load that he had to go, had rejected, had come back. It had uh, radiation. Hmm. And it was probably from a piece of oil filled pipe or something. Um, I mean, we got docked on it because he had to bring the load back, go through it. Detect which bail was tear it apart or just reject. Uh, he said, "Best thing to do would be to have a, you know, it's a basically like a Geiger mm -hmm. hand mm -hmm. uh, He's supposed to get back with me on information of where I can obtain one in the cost. He said we're around three hundred and fifty. Just, just to check that. And, and uh, you know, I, I do recall back getting a load of some stuff from the Paul's or for the service. I'm gonna spend the whole place. The only way I can think of where it comes from." Probably some oil field equipment. Here. And I, did, I got my paperwork back on uh, your call a while back. We had uh, it's been several months ago. We had uh, Terracon do some work on the, on the cost estimation for closure and post closure. Uh, I got that paperwork back, and uh, it's quite costly if we ever had to. Close and that was for the 4.3 years of putting the actual closure and permanent closure on the three. Just hit that in now. The pit I had beforehand and the CMG. There's three CMG pits there. The new one and two old ones. I feel one is for trash. They have a foot of interim cover on it. The cost to close at 4.3 acres is 200 and some thousand dollars. Uh, that's it's in the city. Closure would be 
take the one foot inch and cover it up, put 18 inches, come back and put a cap on it. Has to have two arms, obviously, the vegetation might be moving in. Then, uh, of course, the, uh, the uh, vegetation and settlement cover is a 30 year cost. And that was the county for the clay that I have. I've got a stockpile out there to the far east of the property that was the, I kept the clay that came out of it. But once we got having the clay that I saved it. So that can be used on the internet and made covered for one. The cost is also covered in the after the blue the clay and the work of having it covered. So you think that's going to have to happen then? We'll have to cover it right there. Well, soon, no, not soon. Um, see, when uh, when we went through all this re permitting and everything, when we dug that new cell, we got permitted to go above grade because we were at the last cell. Which actually, um, when I had my I had my inspection about a month ago, and I was talking to the inspector, who um, you know, he wasn't in violation or anything. I told him that the MSW cell number one, which is clear south end of the property, uh, we had to dig and find the bleeding edge of that cell. And Jody had dug six to eight feet before we ever hit waste. And I told him, you know, that was before my time that there was eight, six to eight feet of cover on the cell. And I was not sure there was a lot of waste of space. I said, uh, the chamber can't excavate that long. He said, well, you can't. So they're on the you can't do it. Yes, you can do it. So there's you know, there's that availability also. But it'd be, you know, once once you got every bit of your space consumed and used, you'd be far up to avoid having to close then you go above creek. No the only drawback to that is then you have to either come up and hurt by your because you have nowhere on the site to get hurt. It's all in those sets. But that would put that off of I go on the on top of this. And looking back at the map, where my building sits, all the way east to the fence, there's no settlement. So that can be basically to do with it. Uh, I spoke with him last night. I stopped by there to buy some metal. And uh, he said he was coming. So. Okay. The, uh, you know, we got another, we got this. I've asked him if he, you know, I mean, I just asked him, I tend on, you know, putting in a bit. He said, yeah. He said, his only thing was the same as treating recycling. You know, so the trucks, you know, you can go out through town and tear the streets up. So I was one. If you put your waste right next to where you're already driving, you know, you can run out. So, but I personally wonder if. And if you're, you're running double on this equipment for him, you know, stay together to run plus a month. That'd be up to him. Mm -hmm. If I recall, a couple of months ago, whenever it was, when he, when he, when he, when he came in, he was talking about this single stream and he would be hauling it to waste management or something and they in turn would, would separate. Yeah. Whereas nice is talking about two carts hauling the recycles to their facility and the trash <coughs> to the landfill which would definitely cut down on the tonnage. And then there was some mention about if cardboard and stuff was contaminated with broken glass and stuff, and it was it wasn't of any wasn't as greater value than what it is. It's clean, mm -hmm. so that's what <clears throat> makes me think more toward two carts rather than than one cart. And I think. I think on single stream, you have to pay the company that all the trash goes to.
rather than us paying to for the trash to go to the landfill, it would go to a, a sorting facility, and you, and you would pay them a tipping fee. Correct. That's what he described it. Oh, so. Whereas you know, well, last night he told me that he talked to that place in Hutch and waste management. Yes, waste management. And they told him, you know, they would not charge you. They would take the waste with no charge. Okay. This is what he told me. So. Well, my, my first question is, are we really responsible for the trash service of the citizens of Stabber County? I mean, we provide ambulance service, we provide fire, and we provide this and this. Well, they're actually double paid. Correct. I'm paying all my taxes. Yes, and then that's why I said last week, it's, you know, it's the taxpayers are paying regardless. Yeah. I mean, the customer as well as the taxpayer. I mean, <coughs> people that don't even use trash service are getting taxed for the time. <coughs> you guys, I think, can totally get out of the game and just the property it tax. Up. Oh. Property tax forms are supplementing mm -hmm. people in the city that are renting their house to pick up their trash. It's the way it's working out now. In this meeting on the 19th at the annex, that will be with the bidders that are bidding on also. I've invited all three of them. Invited mm -hmm. And mainly to exactly let the city councils know what's going on. What's going on? Whether, whether these guys are going to get out of the game and it's going to get billed through the cities for the tonnage, um, that's what they're going to have to decide and have a game plan for that meeting. So. I mean, they can take the money's out of it. It's open market. Come March 31st, we're done. We can contract with each city or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That would be the way to go. Unless it's still legal. That's <laughs> 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 why I have a question mark. I don't need to talk to Joe. I can't think it's of that one. I've been surprised. Uh, well, there's an ongoing conversation. We'll reset. We have three or four hours to talk about this No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> no, we <really> don't. <laughs> Darn. You might be by yourself. <laughs> when lunch happens, we're done, man. Huh? Well, before that. Way before that. Even before that. that. Right, really. Thank you. And we have trash issues. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Well, what we want to do is, of course, go through renewal. Sarah it does a lot of our compliance and the Affordable Care Act and the things that, so this is kind of appropriate time to go through that. And your plan's really pretty good, but there's a couple things that we wanted to talk about, and then we're going to go through some history with your plan and, of course, the renewal. So, and it won't take that long. So I'm going to let Sarah fire away, and then we'll, we'll jump in here later, so. Thank you. Well, you have a really um, awesome awesome in the health insurance particularly on here, but it's an awesome opportunity because um, small groups with the self-insured platform are really, at least in my opinion, going to win here in the Affordable Care Act landscape of health insurance. I know you have about 43 enrolled in the plan, but do you know of your total employees? Are you going to exceed 50 total employees? Okay. So you will be subject to those large employer provisions, but as far as your plan design is concerned right now, you're in a pretty good spot to not need to make any changes to comply with the health care reform, except for a few minor details like um, waiving your pre-existing conditions exclusions. You need to go to an unlimited maximum on essential health benefits. And then there is some clinical trial language that would need to change. In the past, you would be able to not cover some of the routine services that would go along with their clinical trial. And now that that has been a little bit firmed up for the patients that are in the clinical trial, if they go get lab or imaging done, that would be paid by the plan, where in the past you could have said that was part of the clinical trial. But other than that, uh, small groups are really going to win because the underwriting in the stop-loss world has 
kind of loosened up a bit. They, you know, you used to have this really tight grip on individual underwriting and wanting to go down to the individual level. Well, they can still do that. Um, they understand that this guarantee issue will exist. So in 2014, there is no credits. There are no waiting periods longer than 90 days. And they really have taken a step back. And from what we've seen this year out of the stop loss market has been um, a far more generous approach to underwriting. Uh, they still do have individual lasers when appropriate, but depending on how you view that on your plan, it's sometimes better for the masses of the plan to identify one risk that may or may not um, come to fruition. But because of the uh, self-insured platform that you're on, there's a lot of mandates right now going on in the healthcare reform laws that you wouldn't even need to worry about. You're going to hear a lot about them in the, in the media. There are some out-of-pocket limits and some deductible limits. And in the fully insured market, there is a whole slew of mandates that these plans have to uh, comply with. But for your plan particularly, you can still have a deductible as high as you'd like to have it, even though when reviewing your benefits, they are extremely generous. Um, but you wouldn't be limited to any deductible. You wouldn't be uh, subject to any of the health insurance fees that are going out there. There are a couple to know about. One is the PCORI fee, uh, which you would have filed last year in July. And then there is another one coming up this year called the Transitional Reinsurance Fee, which is how self-insured plans are helping fund the governmental exchanges as far as the risk is concerned. The counting method is the same as the PCORI fee, but the big difference is that the PCORI fee, it was $1 per belly button on your plan. And with the Transitional Reinsurance Fee, it's $63 per belly button on your plan. Mm. Um, per year. Per year. It's scheduled to go up, but it does go away. I think what's important to note is that if you're self-insured, you pay that. It is an expense that you can come out of the plan asset. It's not a tax. And in the fully insured market, the insurance company has to pay as well. So whether they tell you the $63 increase is due to their, their portion of the transitional reinsurance fee, it exists on both sides of the health insurance world. There has been some recent announcements come out just with FSAs and HRAs and kind of how those are handled. Your plan doesn't have an HRA on it, so I won't go into much detail about those unless you're interested. Uh, but I think the most important thing to note is that your plan is in a good spot. You offer it to the right amount of hours. I believe it would be deemed affordable. Um, that, that would be a calculation that you do. Um, the only thing that you need to worry about is if you have anybody who is working those 30 hours per week or more that you may not already offer coverage to. And what we find a lot in municipalities may be a volunteer fire department or a fire department that has like an on-call shift. Those hours you've never had to be concerned about in the past, but from our understanding and the guidance that we've read that you would have to count those hours as hours worked while they're on call. So you might have a pocket of people who would be eligible for the plan that may never have been eligible before. Um, but the reinsurance companies have gotten hip to what's going on in the federal landscape and it's not a big deal to them. That's the flyby of healthcare reform. See, it's easy. It's easy. <laughs> when you ask the question of the 50 employees, what's that going to do to you if you're over that? Well, when you're over 50 full-time equivalent positions, then you are subject to the big, it's called pay or play. In the statute itself, it's called the employer shape share pay provision. And that's where they say that you have to offer a major comprehensive health insurance plan that is both affordable and meets minimum value. Uh, both of the plans that you offer now, and I, I have a note in our system that says Plan 1, there was consideration to do away with Plan 1, this renewal. Right. Uh, both of your plans meet the minimum value standard, which is uh, a fancy way of saying it's good enough. So it pays 60% or more of the cost of the program for your participants. Yours are more in the high 80s at this point, so you would be comparable to like a silver plan on the exchange or a gold plan. Um, and when you think of like the premium, when Dennis goes through the renewal, renewal, and you look at what the premium for this plan would be compared to what a gold level premium is going to be in the individual market or the exchange, I, I, I think you've heard all the media about sticker shock and the price and the cost of renewing an individual policy. You've been very fortunate over the past several years here to have a pretty 
balanced approach, and at times it may feel like your expenses spike and decline, but for the most part, you've been very stable. And I don't know if they will continue to find that in the uh, public offerings. One of the problems, that I think, was in the 50, there, there was concern in the industry that there might be an employer with 50, 51 people who would have to follow the mandate, might want to start reducing employment, get below 50, and then terminate his plan. Because if you, you know, at the 50 level, you know, if you don't if you don't have a plan, then you pay a bunch of penalties. You, know, you pay the tack hammer and the sledgehammer penalties they're talking about. And so there was concern it might have had the opposite effect, that unintended consequence. Some employer might actually say, well, I'm not even going to offer it anymore. Heck with it, I'll, I'll cut my staff, get down to 49 people, I don't have to do anything. And, uh, or the other side of that would be to reduce, you know, reduce hours, reduce people for 30 hours. And so there's that consequence. But you guys, you don't have that concern. So. That's why it got such traction in the, in the news. It is delayed for 2014. That's the big thing. And whether or not they can delay the individual mandate is kind of yet to be. I think November will be a very telling month when we decide to do. Uh, but as far as an employer is concerned, whether you offer insurance or make it affordable or good enough, there is no reporting requirement or penalty to be assessed if you don't follow the law as it's written to you get that relief. Okay. Let's do the report. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at this first. Unless you have questions. More questions. So kind of start to gear us up for the actual renewal itself. This takes a look on the back of the first page. It's just a trend overview. I took it over the past uh, 12 quarters here. So beginning in January of 2011, going through the end of uh, the, uh, October 2013. This is, on the top you'll see, the gold bar is how your members' portion of payments have um, increased and decreased. The blue is the discount that the plan receives by utilizing that PPO network that the preferred provider's organization. And the green bar is the plan's payments. It is inclusive of reinsurance payments, so in years that you have large claims and reinsurance kicked in, you can see those uh, green spikes go up. But it kind of gives a good picture of, as you kind of truck along in a year, the plan payment starts slow, it decreases a bit. Once members satisfy their out-of-pocket, of course, the plan has a little bit more responsibility, and then it resets every you know, fourth quarter, it starts over again. You can see in the years that perhaps there were claimants uh, or claims that were larger than what was to be expected. You can see how not only the, the plan had to uh, react, the member responsibility reacted, and in many of those situations we can go out and get better negotiations on the cost of that of the episode of care so you can see the discount of the spikes up as well. That's just a nice easy way to look at all the numbers Dennis is going to go through here and I'm more of a picture person myself. On the next page this just takes a shot at claims paid and incurred in this calendar year beginning in January and getting ending in October. So while your aggregate policy and we'll talk about that more during the renewal covers more than just this year. This is looking at, from January to October, claims that you have paid. You can start at the top and you can see the total charges for your claim uh, come close to about $600,000. You can see how your savings through your networks, uh, primary networks and secondary networks, those are networks that we um, have access to. They're no longer ID cards, but when someone goes out of network, we um, scour the market for additional savings for the plan and the members. You can see how the members' payments have split out between deductibles, co-insurance, and co-payments, ending with the total plan payment this year. The two tables at the bottom that you can review, the top one is the plan impact. So you think of where are the plans going to be their dollars. These six categories can give a nice summary of where your dollars have been spent as a plan as far as what types of benefits are being paid, the diagnosis and the lifestyle categories, as well as the physicians, the facilities, and the age groups. And if you look at the second table, you'll see where those member impact zones are. So where are members spending their money? And you can see it says the six, the six um, items there on the side. You can see exactly where they're spending. Okay. Next page. On the back of that page is a network utilization summary. The self-insured plans when you, you rent a network, then you have that preferred panel of providers and facilities. 
and this is a really positive view. We have a lot of, uh, in Kansas, the networks are, are few and far between as far as what our options are for rental networks. Some carriers have proprietary networks and you know they, they don't have to show you this information. So to be able to see that while you're spending dollars to, to lease a provider's care network for your members, it is giving you overall about a 43% discount. So for each dollar that's being paid out, if you look at that top table of, of uh, in-network breakout, the plan is paying almost 50 cents of every dollar. The providers are writing off 43 cents, and so your members are paying just between 8 and 9 cents for every dollar the claim is going out. So this is a very positive outlook. In some of the areas of Kansas where the discounts aren't as great or the facilities in the neighborhood don't give much consideration to networks, you don't see you know, about a 30% discount overall. So if you're getting a 43% discount, you're in a really good spot. It also means that your members are using the network of providers that you are asking them to so The Great South the Auto Network as well, but you can see that about 96, 95% of all of your claims are running through the network. There are all situations where someone would have to buy a network. Specialty care is the most common, and that's where we go on the this category. Just a couple more. Here's a paid claims distribution chart. And the blue bars on top are your percent of participants on your plan. And the black bars are the percent of plan payments. And so you're in a very good spot to see that of the total membership, 46 of the claim of the participants on your plan haven't even exceeded $249 in claims payments this year. And that could be they've had services that have only hit their own deductible. They haven't moved into the co the co insurance provisions of your plan, or they haven't seen a doctor at all, which could be good or bad, depending on how you look at that. That's about half your membership right now is not even spending $250 of the plan assets. You can see that there are some claimants on the plan who start to, you know, incur some expenses. But when you look up there and see in that ten thousand to twenty-five thousand dollar category, um, it's probably important to note that something as simple as having a baby is about fifteen thousand dollars in form. So it doesn't mean that the sky is falling and people are incurring tons of claims. It just means that you know, you've had a couple babies, a broken arm, a surgery, things like that can tip you in there. Um, I had a renewal a couple weeks ago, and they, the bars had to go all the way up to between $150,000 and $250,000. So when you think about how much money could actually be spent out in a year for the cost of care, it seemed to have a good yeah, number. Yeah, $50,000 is not much. I mentioned that uh, I, I know you guys are, or at least are maybe considering a fully insured plan, and probably one of the best arg arguments for being partially self-funded is, is this information right here. As, you know, we've said for years and years and years that 80% you know, of your claims, and probably more might be 90% of your claims come from 10% of your people. And of course, you have a stop loss component, which we'll look at in your stop loss contract. But when you have catastrophic claims, and those get peeled off to the reinsurance carrier, so your your exposure is limited. And then you've got the masses of people under that who are having very few dollars in claims. So, so the it's, it's what, kind of what drives people to partial self funding because they get the benefit of the good years, they never really see the bad years because the stop loss component kicks in. So it's kind of seen the world even more so. You guys have been there for a long time. There's a lot of groups your size and you know, maybe a little bit bigger than yourselves that are migrating toward partial self funding for that reason. It gives them actually more stability. Some people think it's like, well, I'm, I'm more exposed. In reality, you're probably less exposed because you don't have to deal with all those uh, hard costs of a fully insured plan that when those things ratchet up by 5 or 10 or 15% a year, they go up in a hurry. You know, you know, the old rule of 72, you have a 10% renewal and you double your rates every year. So, so and, and we kind of, and we'll look at some history here, but we kind of hopefully take you away from that. But, you know, go ahead. The last report shows you kind of the positive side of really what is happening in your plan. And it is different than a lot of the municipalities that we work with that I'm seeing, but this is your enrollment activity shift. And so you can see that um, at the end of December of 2012 versus the end of October of 2013, Go to the far right hand side, you can see the change. You can see where your membership is growing and where it is moving into the next age band up. A lot of the buzz that I'm hearing in the fully insured market that they're in 
older group, you're going to see a rate reduction because of the new community modified rating and how they can't put as much load for the disparity in age or gender. But when you look and see what's happening with you folks, you're actually losing um, members in the age brackets that would be beneficial in a fully insured plan. And it is beneficial in a self-insured plan too because it just keeps your average age a little bit lower, which will help when they come up with their rating systems. Everyone uses some level of underwriting and rating. So it does show that you, you, know, you are trending in the right way as far as who's coming on your plan, who you're hiring, or who is coming to work for, the, for you. Uh, they are, it makes you very desirable in a self-insured market because you have the right mix of, of membership at this point. Okay. Well, let's look at some of these numbers. The uh, sheet there on your, your left. You should have. What I wanted to look at some history today before we talk about renewal and, and explain my sheet here at the top. Uh, first off, we're showing a static enrollment for all these years, so it'll be, it'll be hard for me to go back and find these numbers perhaps because at the very top we're representing the group you have today. 18 employees, 10 spouse, 2 children, 13 families, total 43. But then I take those numbers and I, and I look at the averages that you had for expenses. I'm starting off with going back to 2004, and you'll see my columns 2005, 6, 7, 8 across the top. And rather than mash through all these numbers, let's go down to the bottom and look at the bottom two numbers. Our fixed costs of operating the plan, that's admin fees, reinsurance premiums, you know, PPO fees, those things that generate the hard cost. And you can see how static they've been, 111, 1,107, 111, 114, so relatively flat. Uh, that's the, one of the, again, the pluses we have in self-funding is we're able to keep our fixed costs uh, predictable. Even your total, though, claims, that bottom number is, is designed to be a representation of what your total cost would have been going back through those years. And you can see those numbers start at 400, down to 300, 340, uh, and then uh, 2008, 416,000. So again, relatively flat. To flip the page, I got the most recent, again, picking up at the top, we got 2009. And then we're going to bring it up to current 2013. Again, let me, let me pull you down to the bottom. Fixed cost, 101000 112 So over a course of, what, 10 years, we started back 10 years ago with fixed costs of 111, and 10 years later we're at 124. Last year, 118. So our fixed costs uh, are actually remarkably level. And even in your maximum costs, we're showing 400, 400, 434, 401. Actually, this year we're projecting, and we're, we, what we do this year is we take the claims you paid to date, and then we project it out and, so that you can finish the year, hopefully on the same trend you're on. Hopefully it'd be less. It could be less. Uh, but we're showing $500,000. So even in that regard, if you were in, in, in a lot of examples, uh, that would be pretty stable in our world. So, you know, historically, you've seen a lot of 10, 15, 20% bumps, and that's the thing, again, Mr. Joe can try to drive away from. So, you guys have actually had a very, very, very good history. Uh, now, let me take you to the next page, and then we'll look at the current. And this will get us into renewal. The first column is, your, is the current, and, uh, and let, me, let me run through this real quick just to set the stage. Uh, you're with QBE, that's the current carrier. You have a $30,000 specific, so that stop loss where you get bailed out, anything over $30,000, the carrier jumps on. You can see your premium for that's $90,000. A year. I annualized this premium for the entire year on that enrollment we just looked at. You have an aggregate premium. That aggregate premium puts an umbrella over the whole world. So your umbrella, what we call an attachment point, is 448000 So if you had the worst world you, uh, claim year you can ever imagine, everybody has a $30,000 claim. You run that out and say, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. Well, once it hits $448,000, you're done. So you can't, if you have uh, 50 people hit $30,000, you're not going to pay a million five, you're going to pay four forty eight. Now that's uh, never happens, but uh, good I guess we could, but never does. Fixed costs are $27,000. You can see our admin fees, the way they're itemized out. So again, when we get to the bottom, our fixed cost $124,000 for the year. Uh, uh, and then the maximum, five seventy three based on the max. And again, I just mentioned a second ago, we expect you to spend this year about $500,000. That's what we're expecting. The ceiling is 573, so you're not, not really that close to the ceiling. Now, we come to renewal option one. All of these options across the top are, are renewal options. Option one is with QBE, the same carrier, and just to hit the high points, because we're pretty much illustrating the same thing, 
their renewal takes your stop loss premium from 90000 to 97000 So that would be a uh, 7 8% increase on the stop loss premium. The ag premium is virtually flat. Uh, it was $10 or something, $15. The attachment factor, now it's that ceiling that we set over the world, is going up a little bit. And the, and the way they do this, that thing can go up and down. What they basically do is they take your paid claims for the year, they annualize it. They put in what they call a corridor, which is basically 25%. Then they put trend on it for what they think inflation might be. That becomes your new ceiling. So if you had a $100,000 in claims, the first thing they would do is ratchet it up 25%. Look, these guys just spent 100. We're going to put a ceiling over. We're going to push it up 25% because we want to have a little cushion in this thing. We're going to trend it. Let's say trends 10%. So if your ceiling today was 100, your new ceiling would be 135, 25% plus 10%. So that's basically how you get to this number. Number can come down just like it goes up, because that's pretty much the thing it follows. So if you have a tremendous year next year, you can expect your ceiling to come down. Uh, so your new ceiling is 534. You come down to the bottom. Your fixed costs go, go from 124 to 132. And again, that difference. Is simply the $7,000 of the spec training. It's bumped up a little bit. And then, of course, you add the two together and you get the new max. We always go out and shop these things. We have several carriers, stop loss carriers. Our stop loss carriers, we plug and play. So we can unplug somebody, plug in somebody. So we, we have about 20 stop loss carriers that we work with routinely. We, we send everything out to them so we can get the best. We are an incredibly transparent world. So everything I get from one carrier, I tell the other carrier. And then we let them fight for business. Who wants this business? And that way, and usually what will happen, and we do that with the incumbent, if we get a carrier that gives us a better number than our incumbent, we'll tell the incumbent, say, hey, this has been a pretty good account. We probably don't want to lose it, but you're going to have to match this guy's numbers or it's going south. And nine times out of ten, the incumbent will come back. So what we've got here, as you can see, and I, I, did, I only illustrated the ones that are on here. We could have shown more. But we've got Westco, option two, HCC, option three. And then option four is simply Q, the same carrier with, but with a higher stop loss level, going from 30000 to 45, which I actually wouldn't recommend. But we, we always illustrate it. Uh, but you look at Westco, and you'll see their renewal, uh, or it was not their renewal, but it's 108000 I'm looking at the premium, stop loss premium, HCC is 125. So, and, and the way this worked out, and when you go down to their attachment factors, they're pretty level. Uh, go down to the aggregate factors, I guess I mentioned our renewals, 534, 100, 534,000, 537, 543 going across the sheet. So, it would appear that their aggregate factors are reasonable and, and with the scheme of the, the way they do things. Uh, obviously, QBE gave us the best numbers in regard to. Uh, the stop loss premium. So, and while we can talk about option four, uh, personally, I, I think forty-five thousand is too much money. I think thirty thousand is a good threshold of forty dollars. I wouldn't really recommend. And it doesn't have to be forty-five. We we can ratchet these things up incrementally. I could move to thirty-five or whatever number you want. But actually, your size and crew, I think you personally, I think you probably where you need to be in terms of what a stop loss level should be. But. So at the end of the day, uh, we've got a renewal where the I didn't I didn't figure this out, but it looks like the fixed costs are going up uh, about five percent, and that's always been the driver for us is because claims are claims. We always try to drive down fixed costs. Uh, again, just to make the point against a fully insured plan, if your if your fully insured plan costs you a half a million dollars and you have a five percent renewal, that's twenty five thousand dollars because it's the whole nut. And our our fixed cost is just the fixed cost you see. So on our our five percent renewal, you've got a eight seven eight thousand dollar increase. Uh, so you, you're dealing with less fixed cost. Then you of course then you always deal with the claim side. And uh, and there's more and more things that are that we're doing with claims. Now, in fact, the, the point of information like this actually we skinny this thing up a lot. This thing's about this thick, and it it tells you. Everybody that went to the chiropractor on Tuesday afternoon, if, if you want to, you can really drill into it. The point of that is not to get snoopy, but to maybe you can use that to drive claim information. You know, for example, if you had a, 
a lot of diabetics, and you might want to step up your diabetic education to help people be more compliant. And so you try to drive that way to help to help claim dollars. Uh, and uh, but we we felt I think it's things like this the reporting you never see reporting like this with your claim. You'll never know what happened. They'll never tell you a thing. They'll come and give you a renewal, but when you ask them for information, you, you won't get it. You won't you won't have a clue what happened. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of things that have driven people to partial self-funding, and I think hopefully we've illustrated those today. Now, having said all that, if you wanted a fully insured plan, I could get you a fully insured plan. Uh, we, we're not, we're not uh, totally immune to those. I mean, we, there, there could be opportunities for those, and we, and we work with Coventry and all the different fully insured plans. So I could get you a fully insured plan and, and put an HRA on it and, and do all that stuff for you if you wanted to. But... Uh, uh, I really think the, what we're, the world we're seeing is definitely moving toward what, we're, what you're already doing. We don't see people moving away from it. We see people moving into it because of the advantages of keeping your fixed costs down, understanding your claim spend, and then hopefully be in the groups. Our employers are absolutely getting more and more and more proactive in trying to educate people and their employees and keeping claim costs down and managing some of that nut. So. They're not partially self-funded now. We're fully self-funded. No, you're partially self-funded. You're partially. When we throw in the word partially, it's because you're, there's a stop-loss component of thirty thousand. Oh. If you were a large employer like, I don't even know if they are, but like General Motors, they may not even have a stop-loss component. They may just self-insure. Self-insure means you write a check for the whole thing. Right. There is no point where you do not get to right. get bailed out. When you're partially self-funded, you're only self-funded up to thirty thousand dollars. After that, they, somebody walks in with, well, the new, the new uh, forty care things. Everything's unlimited. I mean, I've never seen one, but you could have a ten million dollar claim. We, uh, we've actually had in our office a five million dollar claim. Uh, but uh, so you wouldn't. Nobody wants. Nobody in my world wants to not have some kind of right. stop loss. Nobody can. You, you'd need to be an employer with. 15, 20, 30,000 employees before you'd ever even think about not having stop loss. So, uh, and then there was a year, and when we first started doing these things, the minimum stop loss you could write in Kansas is 10,000. And then and then it's just a matter of what makes the most sense. Do I want $10,000 stop loss and what's the premium? Do I want 20, what's the premium? Do I want 30, what's the premium? It's not unlike what you do with your homeowners when you think, about, well, do I want to push my deductible up? Pay less premium. I have a claim, but I haven't had one. Uh, year in and year out, am I better off to have a little higher deductible and pay less premium? And that's what we try to illustrate. You know, you, do you have? A, is it a little bit more volatile? Yeah, it's a tiny bit more volatile because you could have two or three thirty thousand dollar claims in the third year in, the, in, the, in the one year, and at the end of the year, you might look back and say, "Damn, I wish I hadn't done that." But nine times out of ten, you're going to look back and say. I did the right thing. You know, in the big picture, I did the right thing. So. The reason we're going to do away with plan one is because we have no body on the lower deductible. So we're just going to act that. We don't even offer it. Okay. So that's now, people make the same decisions that you guys make. They look at taking more resources. What's it cost me to get plan A? What's it cost to get plan B? What's used for that money? I'm going plan B. It's just the nature of the beast. We, we offered it when we switched, um, when we raised the rates for the employees. We offered that plan and nobody. Knew. Everybody went with the 500000 So that's why we're, we're not going to offer that. I didn't think anybody knew. I think the most common plan in Kansas right now is a fifteen hundred dollar deductible, a fifteen hundred dollar deductible, and then eighty twenty co insurance to the thousand two thousand with office with the co pays. And so they, they need their deductible and still pay their co pay at the door. Really nice. Yeah, the, yeah. One thing I failed to mention: the big driver for what we do has always been lower fixed cost, which in your your hard costs here we've looked at and they've been remarkably stable over ten years. Uh, Plan flexibility. We can do literally anything you want to do on plan design. Now, admittedly, most groups don't want to get too excited on that, but we could give you a 
$723 deductible if that's what you want. I mean, we can we can dial those things in, get you the kind of prescription benefits you want. But so fully insured plans, it's kind of square big, square hole. I mean, they only offer two or three plans. You gotta find yourself in that plan and then live with it. Uh, we can we can tailor make it what we want. So we can sit down then probably not today, I'm sure you have other things to do. But if you wanted to sometime and, and look into to the point I made earlier, what could or should we be doing maybe to drive behavior so that people perhaps take care of better care of themselves? Although you look at your, you get so many people don't use the point at all, so maybe, maybe we've accomplished that all already. And the other thing is reporting, which we've tried to show today. Uh, it, it's always been fixed cost, flexibility, reporting. But those are the drivers in our world. So uh, as, as we sit here today, and unless uh, you can tell me something different, I mean, and we'll go back and we can we can do anything you want on this. I can shake some different numbers. We can look at some different spec levels. Uh, as I mentioned, we can dial this thing in to, so that it fits like a glove. Uh, the renewal looks pretty good to me. Uh, and what we're seeing in our world, uh, our stop loss, this is pretty consistent with what we've seen on our stop loss course where we're getting, you know, two, three, four, five percent renewals. Uh, and keep in mind the carriers, uh, part of this too is the carriers are having to step up to unlimited maximums. You've had a $2 million max, uh, we're, 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 they're taking on the unlimited max. Uh, so the, there's some of those things to dial into that as well. If you are considering alternative plan designs, you know, it's the same rule if you were to increase the cost to your membership and obviously your plan pays less and the same is true in this world so when you look at those attachment point factors those add factors mm -hmm. right now they're set on your current plan mix uh, if you were to increase your deductible to, to a thousand or two thousand or whatever that number is that would have an impact on what the carrier would say that the plan would have responsibility for at that point so you can find relief um, if you're looking for plan relief, you know, the, the trouble with that is is that if you're not paying it, someone is. And the same is true in, in wherever you get your insurance, is if the plan isn't paying, the insurance company is. And when we speak in front of the panel like this, you, know, you are the insurance company at that point for the first $30,000 in the claims. We can do, uh, as part of this, we can do plan modeling mm -hmm. where we can put in a different level of benefits for example, a higher deductible, different co-insurance, whatever you want it to be, and we can tell you, based on last year's claims, how much money it would have saved you as an employer, how much money it would have cost the employees, and we can even tell you which employees it would have affected. So if you if you thought, well, maybe it's time, maybe um, I've been to meetings and everybody's got higher deductibles and maybe we should be doing this, maybe 500 is too low, if you want us to model that, uh, tell us what you think you might want, and we'll, we'll model it and show you what you would have saved, what it would have cost for the employees, and who it would have cost. Uh, is it the end of the years when you give us a report on what claims have been paid and by category? And mm -hmm. We can do well. We can do it now. We were uh, we like I say we shortened this thing up a little bit yeah. today, but we have a we, this thing's about a half an inch thick and. But yeah, we would want to run a full year, get through December 31st, and we can. And again, we can run those reports almost immediately as soon as the year is over. So basically, on right. But I mean, yeah, yeah, right. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. A full report? Yeah, like, the book. Yes, a little yes. Bit, yeah, thin book yeah. yeah. Book. And what the claims were, and what the right. surgery was. We could have done that today you know, through the. Through the time that we went, through. right? I was no, afraid we'd take up too much of your time today, and we're trying to bounce across the top here a little bit. Because I'm, I'm curious of what you know, pharmacy benefits versus dental versus sure. medical versus surgical. And sure. Just, uh, your pharmacy benefits do cost the plan the most right now, is in that category. Because um, I look at them, I mean, mm -hmm. they look, yeah, and when we, and it's just the way your benefit is structured. You, know, you don't have additional co-pays on it. It's all it all feeds towards the same deductible and co-insurance requirements, um, which really you set you set yourself up well because in 2014 uh, there's an out-of-pocket rule that applies to 
fully insured, small groups and fully insured, and then large groups and any self-insured plan gets this relief in 2014 where they can keep these two separate uh, maximums where you can have a medical out-of-pocket maximum and a prescription drug. But in 2015, the way that the law is written is that every dollar a consumer spends for medical or prescription drug services, be it a deductible, a co-insurance responsibility, or a copay, that all counts towards one single out-of-pocket limit. And so you have some plans that are really having to come to terms with, they've maybe had a less than generous prescription drug benefit, uh, specifically in specialty drugs, where maybe they make a member pay $1,000 for their own prescriptions, and that's never counted towards that member's out-of-pocket. And the plan was able to have that benefit of knowing that the member would pay that $1,000 every month, and they could have a $12,000 savings at the expense of their member. <coughs> Well, the healthcare reform laws have, have tightened that up and that some plans have to comply in 2014, everyone will comply in 2015 with that member's $1,000 will count towards an out-of-pocket, and those out-of-pocket limits are mandated through the federal government. For 2014, it's $6,350 is all an individual can pay, and $12,700 for a family. So when you think about those outward limits as they exist today, people were my own plan is way outside of that. I mean, we have a pretty big out-of-pocket expense this mm -hmm. year. We look at about $35,000 as a family if, if the wheels fell off of my family. So it helps families like mine. Um, but I have a much higher rate in 2014 because of it. This report was done through the end of October. Yeah, we, the report you're talking about, I, we can run it through October. And no, then I, was, down I was just curious. Because yeah. on the pharmacy, on the pharmacy benefit, eighty percent of allowable cost of eligible medication. So yes. if it's a four dollar generic, then the, then the patient is going to pay eighty cents. Mm -hmm. uh, once they've hit their out of pocket their, their That's right. You know, and any thing that you tweak to the plan would have impact on all the numbers that we looked at. Um, and you can do whatever you want to do in 2014, but in 2015, everybody has to play in the same arena mm -hmm. of having this out-of-pocket rule. So it would, there's a lot of plans right now making one-year decisions based on what they can do in 2014 versus what they're going to have to do in 2015. And what I think is really, it kind of reminds me of life insurance. I've been working with life insurance. People don't think about needing life insurance until they get about 50 or 55. And then at that point, it's really expensive because the one thing about life insurance is the carrier knows at some point you're going to die. You know, the older you are, the, the closer you are to dying. Uh, there are a lot of smaller groups. Self-insurance has really become appealing because they have never known why they had to pay so much. They feel like they've been protected because of state rules as far as how much of an increase a plan could take um, or an insurance carrier could give. And they are now wanting to jump into where you guys are, but they are already at a $800 individual premium trying to come over now and become their own insurance company. And so, of course, the carrier doesn't know the history. They don't know the, you know, small groups are a little bit less predictable than a large group would be. and so. They're never finding themselves in such a position to be able to have a hundred and thirty thousand dollar known cost of an insurance program, and, and claims are claims, no matter who's paying them. You just happen to know you're paying them and, and what you're paying them uh, in a general term, you know, what you're paying them for. Anything else? Any questions? Or? Overall, these deductibles are pretty low compared to everything else you see, aren't they? They're pretty low. Yeah, it's a very rich plan. Perhaps not inconsistent with counties, though, because counties tend to seem to offer a little better benefits than the, than the rest of the marketplace. But, uh, uh, but yeah, if you looked at the entire thing with several employers around here and asked them what the benefits are, there wouldn't be many of them with a $500 deductible. You might find a lot of counties with a five hundred dollar but uh, a lot of the counties we work with, um, you know, the five hundred dollar deductible is their premium plan at this point. But if they've gone down the path of offering this premium plan or or base plan, not much different than what you have today. The difference is they don't have a premium plan that was so generous. 
they have a, maybe a $500 deductible and a $1,000 deductible, and they sponsor the $1,000 deductible as far as how they generate what their employer contribution is, and they say, okay, this is what we're going to pay towards the cost of the plans, and if you want better than that, then you pay the difference. And it does make you know, consumers this, at this point have a it's a guarantee issue at this point. In the past, where you, you may have had to have paid whatever your employer had for you to be available because you couldn't go anywhere else to get policy. That all changes mm -hmm. because pre-existing conditions is gone. The individual market is a little more stable in their rating structure. The exchanges are supposed to be another option as well. So when you think about it, in the past, you may have had people who had to take insurance because it was the only avenue they had, and they'll, they'll be able to shop this year. And you never really got to shop insurance in the past. And I think wise consumers will, and employers can put strategies in place to say, you know, we still offer a fabulous benefit package to help with, you know, getting the employees to come work for you and stay with you. But you can also, you know, you offer two plan designs now, you're going to go down to one. You could still offer two plan designs and have your rich one that everyone helps contribute to the richness of the plan and have one that is still better than the market mm -hmm. um, that you, know, you can make affordable for your affordability determination. You only have to have one plan that's affordable. You can move your plan to save the too, though. You know, so many times people make these big jumps and go from 500 to 1,000 and that just shocks everybody. You could go from 500 to 600 you know, and do things incrementally and not make such big steps. Change the co-insurance a little bit, you know, just tweak things a little bit. We again, to our uh, benefit here, we we're flexible. We can do those things for you, so we can dial that in. We don't have to take these gigantic leaps to shock everybody. When you, when you to I think that's a lot better deal than what you're. From what I've heard, you're going to get from the Affordable Care Act if you get in that. Oh, uh, they're not. I mean. People are, you know, if somebody, if you did that, and guys will ask me to do it, she raised my duck, I'm just going to do the exchange. Yeah. They'll be back. I know. They will be back. Yeah, there. I know. For the ones I've heard, they're just like, whoa. Yeah. Because they're not going to, they're not going to be able to get a subsidy because you have a plan that's affordable and it's minimum value. So they're going to have to pay the ticket the ticket's going to, they're going to come back wide-eyed. Because uh, then we'll find an option there, but it's affordable. Any of it happy members haven't even paid out. Right. So, it's deductibles. When I work, I work with, I'm on you know the side of I get to see all the plans and what they're doing with their strategies. And where you do see employers making changes is in that total out of pocket limit. They'll keep a low deductible, um, but then when it comes to I'm helping and you're helping pay for your um, conditions. I mean, you, you cap my responsibility right now at a thousand dollars. So I paid my five hundred dollar deductible. I paid my twenty percent until I paid a thousand more. And that's where I've seen employers, um, you know, making increases to maybe it's twelve hundred and fifty dollars. So the deductible is not changed. If I have the same kind of year that I've had in the past, maybe I know I'm going to pay five hundred bucks my deductible charges. It's a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah. So then you mentioned counties, you do municipalities as well. Yes. Yeah. And just for curiosity's sake, is, is some of the cities or small cities, are they comparable to what we're doing? Or? Well, you know, cities don't, small cities don't generally have the employment that counties do. You know, so they, they're, they're most of these small cities like here, I'm not sure what they have, but it's probably 10, 15 people, be my guess. I don't do anything to sit here, but we looked at it one time a few years ago. Uh, so they wouldn't be a candidate for what we do. Uh, when you get down under 25 employees, uh, they're going to end up on some kind of fully insured plan, uh, or, or they might end up on the exchange. That's where the, 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 you could see some traffic for the exchange. These small, a little, uh, Two-man shops, five-man shops, ten-man shops. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those guys get out of the uh, group business. There's been small groups, and there still is small group insurance, I'm right? But uh, exchanges at some point may look better than those. They do. This, this plan here, mm -hmm. it's in uh, both Blue Cross Blue Shield and Preferred Health Systems when they were Preferred Health Systems. It was a very common plan design that they sold, and so you find a lot of um, employers still having, you know, Blue Cross had their triple option, which was their $500, $1,000, $1,500 deductible option with that 80-20 co-insurance. 
but I think the biggest difference I see from your plan to what a lot of um, other municipalities do is that they still have an office visit in Cocaine, um, which they're going to find themselves having to deal with um, this year that has to apply towards the out-of-pocket maximum where your folks don't have that right now. They've kind of grown accustomed to what a doctor's office visit costs. It does already count towards their responsibility. Um, that's the biggest difference I see, and they typically have a, like a prescription drug card with a co-payment structure on it. Mm -hmm. So you're, you are actually set up very well for where everyone else needs to be moving toward, uh, but it is a very similar benefit structure in a lot of the counties that need to work with. This would be their richest plan. This $500 that would be the richest plan they offer in a, in a, for groups about the water plan. Well, let me say in conclusion here that uh, I think we, I don't know, I, I, can't, I can't remember how far back I go here, but I know I've been here 20 plus years, so we've we certainly enjoyed uh, over this last 20 some years working with you guys, so we hope to work with you another 20 some years. Uh, if you really want a fully insured quote, I mean, I, I would, uh, wouldn't want to excuse myself from that opportunity because I, we could do that for you and do an HRA, I, but as I said earlier, I really. In my mind, I think you were you probably need to be, I think, and, and hopefully this track record here demonstrates that it's been, it's been dependable. And it's, it's not, uh, so, sometimes people look in from the outside, you know, and they think that's partial, some, and it has a tendency to be real volatile, and it very expose you to a lot, and the reality is it doesn't at all, because that's what the stop loss piece is supposed to do, but it, then it allows you to benefit from those really good years. I've said this for years. If you do this five years in a row, you have a year so good you can't believe it. You have a year so bad you can't believe it. But when you have that year, then you know you, you've got that's what the stop loss does. And you've got three years that do exactly what they're supposed to do. And you do that, you know, every five years and over and over and over and over again. At the end of, and we have some uh, one. I think you guys are sitting on a nice reserve. That's where that reserve comes from. You know, you fund money and uh, you reserve it. You, you think you're going to spend this much? You spend this much. You got money left over. You reserve it. And at some point, uh, somebody asked me the other day, you know, we think most groups should probably reserve a half of a year to a year somewhere in there. So if you if you spend this five hundred thousand dollars, you know, obviously in the course of a the year, then obviously if you have five hundred thousand dollars in reserve, you got a whole year reserved. That's in most people's minds enough money to have reserve. And once you reserve more money than that, then maybe it's time to start spending it down either through. Well, you have a number of ways, and you just don't put as much money into it uh, until you get back to that half million dollars. It's kind of a barometer to keep things, you know, to keep things working real well. Okay, I'm sure we out, uh, out, spent our time here. I've heard all good things. But I haven't been here very long, but I've heard good things about your company. I've heard any complaints. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. We uh, we work real hard to try and keep people happy. It is a, it is a service business, so. If something is going wrong, we hope they tell us so we can get it And hopefully we'll make the same mistake twice. So. Yeah. You know, on, on, uh, I noticed on AARP, you know, because I get uh -huh. mailings every once in a while because I'm the senior of the credits at A. Uh, you do. Uh, United Healthcare. Now, are they a, a single carrier or are they, or are they a, a broker type? Sure, you know, healthcare is a carrier. You don't see them a lot around. Are they like here. Blue Cross Blue Shield? Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. They're big carrier. There's the, they're, they're one of the biggies. You know, you get the Blues, Aetna, United Healthcare, Humana, uh, what they call the, uh, the Bucas. Sigma. Sigma. Sigma's Sigma. Sigma in there. Those would be the kind of big dogs. Uh, we don't see those carriers out here a whole lot. They tend to be more east west coast. Uh, in bigger cities. Uh, bigger fish. Yeah, yeah, bigger fish. But they would work probably really well on it. You need one to make sure your network's good. Uh, but I know with ADR, some of those guys will push those guys for med sites and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Appreciate Thank it.
you well, told me. Yeah, well, at that juncture, I had my hands in my <laughs> Couldn't help. Everybody understand all that? You know, it sounds like it's better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Better than it is. So I'm not really sure about everything here. This comes from um, somebody did a survey in 2012. And here's what you can tell. There's a 2,362 residences in the county. And I bet I'm not sure about the parole. Uh, rather than uh, try to get my little county insurance book, it's county of value. I just figured there's 792 square miles in the county. And I knocked off 92 just to just, just use the assumption that there's uh, one house per, per section. <clears throat> and I think just about there aren't there aren't many folks out there who aren't using ourselves or or nicely or Mr. Chisholm. You know, there's a and the last well we expect a twelve month period. And uh eighteen hundred and sixty two tons went to County. I don't know whether that's just ourselves. Or it's, it's three of us combined. 1862. 1862 tons. <clears throat> 31 dollars tons. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good walk around here, isn't it? 50,000. Over 50,000. So when you say customer owned, do they do they have to buy their own dumpster? No, we don't require it. No, I mean here. It's yes. Just... Yeah, there there are people who want to buy their own dumpster because because eventually you know the rates are considerable less mm -hmm. and it pays out for them. Same cost. I mean, that could have just been added onto their 
member rates, and the county just stayed out of it, even at that time when they had to start holding it to nuts, right? Yeah. The trash rates could have gone up, and the county just said, yeah, we're, yeah. we're done with that. Yeah, that, uh, that could be done. Uh, it would probably, uh, probably take a, about a, a years I'm prepared to take about a $2.50 rate increase. Maybe up to 20 cents right now right now we're right now we're 13 dollars with the fuel search earlier mm -hmm. and of course the city gets a dollar so we pay the, we pay the uh, mailing for all the city bills they don't do that in Mexico so they're a dollar cheaper over there or radio they do it in, uh, in Hudson about two years ago people at home campuses we can't collect money from these people. Will you just do the billing? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. Well, we do have a little more control. We can just leave the set. Yeah. But if there's a mess there, we won't. I'll show you what. This is what we give you sometimes. And this one here on the bottom gets consistent like this. <laughs> We don't, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't charge anybody any extra stuff like that. But yeah. It's got to be picked up anyway, you know. Like the, uh, and, and we do things like uh, if somebody gets a body on, we take the plane out of the house. If there's one of us around, we just take the truck over and back it up to the door. The main reason it's, it's good for us actually because then my guys don't have to pick up that. You know, Coming out of the house, it's like you put in that truck and just pick it up off the ground. Yeah. There's some advantage to all that. Um, we don't like to actually enjoy doing it sometimes. I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> so I take it that, and Joe, you can chime in. Um, we're under no obligation as far as the county commissioners go to providing trash service and. Is there a, there's no statutes? No, I mean, it's same thing with your ambulance. You don't have to have an ambulance service. It's usually considered nice to do that. There's no statutory mandate. And, and uh, for, I think you're charging, there's like a figure about $3.50 a month in taxes to pay for this one. Right. And then, and, 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 and then the customer's paying on top, along yeah. with Yeah. And those taxes well, don't pay it. What's that? Well, we tax it. It's or whether he has he, he he bills it. It, 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 it's going it's it's to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen either way. Uh, I just can't figure out why the county's involved. I, for the life of me, I, I've never understood that. The, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not dead sure. But I think I think the county got involved because they weren't able to. Uh, uh, you know, they had two or three people hauling around here, and then mm -hmm. it was a confused mess. And it needed to be lined out. Did you do you remember that the did, did, did you ever know that the county did the county ever own the trash service to run it themselves uh, a long time ago? A long time ago, they did. They had some little, little they're like a hot shop truck thing, a little little mini with them. Actually, here it's, it, it, it actually says that they want us to set up. Well, actually, Bob, they want to set up some dumpsters just on the blacktop roads to, uh, you know, for people to come to out in the country. Well, first of all, what would you say? Yeah. That's all private property out there. You can't put it in the middle of the road. <laughs> but there are some counties and places that do that. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. I think they do that in this county. Our, our sales, we just, we just go, uh, you know, we just go to where we need to go. When we took it over, we said, we actually pretty much promised ourselves more than anybody else. It, it didn't matter where they're at, if somebody wants all our service, we'll make sure it can happen. And, and there's a couple of days we we take a pretty broad stretch of the county, back and forth, zigzag. And, and, uh, 
yeah, we, we, we wouldn't leave anybody out there. We, we wouldn't review the service today. And there's some of them out there that could cost a pretty good bit of money to come to. <laughs> your rural testimony is that yeah. you just have to send your building yourself. So yeah, we, more, we, yeah, we do the building ourselves. Yeah, more chances of not getting paid. Yeah, there, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> or they'll be, they'll be slow. Uh, but we're, uh, if, you know, if somebody's got a dumpster out there and it's clear full and they have to pay their bill, we're not going to leave that set anyway. You know, we, and if, if we don't get paid, they can pay more or something. And, we, you know, everything's gambled and everything. So uh, we just kind of leave it all alone. It, it runs pretty smooth for us, except for fixed trucks. <laughs> I did some study up on, uh, on recycling. And uh, since it, and everything, in these, in, at least in St. John Stafford, they want us in the alleys. Because they, we do tear up the streets. We don't mean to. You know, but you get that, you get one, one of those big trucks loaded down. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you get too close to the size of one of these streets here, you're going to break that pavement. So we're real careful about that. So if we're going to recycle, we would want to do it in the alley. And, uh, and my thought, <coughs> excuse me. My thought would be that uh, uh, I would actually provide two containers. One would be a 32 gallon container to set outside, and the other would be a 20 to use in the house and take it out and put it in the orchard, or even use it out there if there's some, if they've got some overflow. Uh, it cost me about 50 bucks a household to do that. I'll start that up. I'm not sure what kind of participation you get. You know, if everybody did, it would be a big deal. Uh, we're talking about buying, you know, talking about buying at least 2,000 containers. To just, to, just to make it work. Well, I feel if it's offered, people will comply. I mean, it's, it's obvious that we have several people you know, Maxville, Stafford, St. John, mm -hmm. I mean, they're using the recycled trailer. Yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, well, it's my opinion, I think if it's offered, then they'll take advantage of it. But uh, I think at this, this point in time, uh, I think it's consensus that we're going to get out of the trash business. Subsidies and whatever else is involved. So I think you need to figure, and, and here again, it's up to the cities. I mean, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, and, uh, and that's and the reason we're going to have this meeting next week, is so everyone will be on the same page, mm -hmm. knowing what's going on. But I think, uh, I think you need to take pencil to paper and figure out what it's going to be. I think I'm pretty close up with it without the subsidy. It's just, yeah. Anyway, there's like determined half of that subsidy was for fuel, and the other half was for tipping fees. And back then, I don't know how much they were for sure. I know they were uh, twenty-five dollars when we bought Mr. Wellman out in '99. Thirty-one dollars uh, I mean, And when we took when we took it over. Those rates were 10, uh, I think it was 10, 50 or 10, 75. <clears throat> we've raised rates a couple times, you know, and we're, we're still $13. That's all we need to keep the whole thing. With our fuel surcharge, uh, that goes to Kansas and I don't know, they appreciate it. <coughs> well, I think you're you know, right. I, I would, I, the only thing I would, you know, would ask, uh, I mean, we could be near anything and, you know, plan it out and all that stuff. But, uh, you, you still
until you come work with the contract. As a part of it. To, in order to, now see, how do I want to say this? Uh, we never want to be exclusive, but we need a, but we need some kind of contract, you know, to, so we don't get about 16 companies in here chasing each other around and around. In great bandits, I guess. There's 12 trash haulers up there in the city. The county got out of paying the tonnage fees. The yes, contract would have to be contract. with the individual cities, wouldn't it? Uh, well, it, no, it would be with the county, pretty much because uh, uh, because you guys are kind of overseeing the whole thing. It's no, we're not. not with the cities. No, no we're cities. Not. <laughs> I think that's called a violation of antitrust law. I stay awake in that class. What's that? <laughs> what you call a violation of federal antitrust laws? That would be what? I, I missed something. Can you, can you get them in the docket in Wichita looking rather foolish? Yeah, I think your contract's going to be you negotiating with the cities. Okay. And the rural residents, <clears throat> it would be up to each individual. I mean, it already is. Right. You know, I mean, that wouldn't change. This, would, this, this says it's all mandatory. Right. Everybody out there. Uh, I can't see any reason to force somebody to pay us a seventeen dollar fifty cent fee when they don't want to. We don't. We don't. We don't force anything on anybody. You know, even in these towns, uh, it's because I think I mean. You draw the tax off that a little bit. But if somebody doesn't live there, they're not supposed to get charged for the It's supposed to be mandatory for everybody every month. But you just don't feel right about it doing that. You know? Well, I, I mean, this isn't any of the county business, but I do think you'll have an advantage picking up in the alleyway compared to people aren't too left on change. Well, no, I don't agree with that. I'm just treating Well, I can't quite, well, could you imagine this way to play with the side of the street? Yeah. Right. But, but the main reason, rabbits. you know, the main reason we stay off the streets is because we tear them up. We've been asked by at least St. John's staff, you know, to stay in the alley as much as you can, right. which means you can't really use a side of the truck. It's about pretty much got to be a rear one because there's been a lot of room in the middle of Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> I think that'll lead to your advantage. Yeah, and and and, and uh, that's why if we, if we want to go to recycle, uh, that's 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 actually why I want to put them in the alley too. And I mean, and then you know, your big cars like that, they're they're very you know, uh, learning about it, they they blow down a little blow away. But you just you can't actually use them in an alley. And, and I don't want my people having to pick them up by hand. We we got we got a jipper on a couple trucks, you know. But uh, and every time you go to different hand, you gotta change that jipper. We need to modify it so it fits everything and, and uh, you know, I don't have to do stuff but I have figured out. <laughs> Contract would just be a, as a designation of who, of who's, you know. I think, I mean, from looking at the contract that the county had in the past, the only thing they designated was they weren't going to pay the tipping fees and the mileage to haul stuff to mm -hmm. the yeah, and that's, that's all it is. I mean, the, I, I, don't I understand where you're coming from on the, on the exclude, exclusive rights. Yeah. You know, but, that's going to be between the cities and you know, this, yeah. what they decided to do. Well, out in rural areas, uh, uh, I, I think just about everybody's using some money, so to say. Uh, we, uh, we probably go more often, you know, I mean, it's at least by week, but most of them are every week. Uh, and if, 
you know, if the wrong stuff ends up ends up in there and somebody calls, we can still get it because it's going to smell bad for a while. <laughs> okay, so that's, I think you know what, what our viewpoint is, and I guess we'll have this meeting on the 19th. And and then from that point on, it's up to the city. We basically just tell the cities it's in your court. Yeah. Now. Yeah. The consensus reached about paying attention yes. after March 3rd. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Ms. Deacon, what do you have? I have a few things. If you want to recess for a moment, we'll recess for a moment. Okay, just update you guys on some stuff that's through the week. Uh, November 18th, this coming Monday, is our EMS meeting again at 7 o'clock. We'll be doing some splinting practice, getting people out of cars will be great fun. Clay's going this week. Clay's going this week. Great. We can do a car. He's got a splinter. He's injured. He already has a splinter. Oh, well, he's injured. 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 <laughs> okay, um, EMT state paperwork for the state, of Kansas. I'll let you guys know how we do this. I went ahead and submitted the paperwork for the class. I uh, won't wait for approval, and then when I get approval for that, then 30 days prior to the first day of class, I can submit for state funding. And then we'll get the approval for state funding, and class is tentatively going to start January 13th. I've had two other people approach me about the class now, or possibly up to 12. Oh, sorry. Which is good. Um, Transfers this week are a little bit of a challenge for us because we've got one of our full-timers on vacation. We've got another that is a key player in Stafford that's on vacation also. So right now, we've got a full-service ambulance that is two people staffed out of the St. John limit, and then we've got a first responder in Stafford for the day, and that's it. Um, at night, everybody comes back full. So at 6 o'clock, uh, we'll be able to trans take transfers, not a problem, but during the day, we're having a problem this week. Um, we did have two new um, possible volunteers. I've got one that's going to finish EMT class up in December. She's going to test um, December 11th is the last class she will be testing between December and January. And another one was an EMT that was prior to the service that is thinking about coming back because she moved and is thinking about relocating back here and wants to come back to us. And she's going to be starting paramedic class in January also. So she'll be kind of hit and miss as to when she could take call, but at least that's two more volunteers we can get before May. <laughs> so that's pretty much all I had for you guys. That's good. Yeah. So May, so or something. May is when the EMT students will finish up. Oh. And so have possibly 10 to 12 yeah. more. Okay. So <laughs> I didn't know. So I didn't, I didn't clarify well, you, that. The way you mentioned May, I thought it might have been a cool <laughs> yeah. or something. No, it, it starts in January. <laughs> Class starts in January wraps up in May. I didn't say that. Okay. So it may hopefully we'll be adding 10 others. Okay. So the paramedic class is how long? Uh, paramedic class is 15 months. 15. But this girl is an EMT already, and she's been an EMT for probably 10 years. And so she can still operate as an EMT until she gets her paramedic. And then she can volunteer as a, as a paramedic, but it won't be until probably May 20. 2015. But, you know, yeah. I like to do yeah. the tunnel, so. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. And we're still waiting for... Is Tom coming? <laughs> yeah, we can do all this. Okay, we've got yeah. minutes, yeah. we've got... Extra corrections. Corrections, a beer license, and KBT. 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 How many times should we do the, accept the tax roll corrections? Sorry. And then secondly, accept the tax roll corrections. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, thank you very much. I move we uh, approve the minutes from uh, November 6th. Second that. We move and second. We adopt the minutes from uh, November 6th. You said 6th? 6th. 6th. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried.
through the cereal malt beverage license for the cans of co-op. Second that. Then moving to the second way, the license, cereal malt beverage for cans of co-op. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say aye. 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 KDK.
I'll second it. <laughs> All in favor to accept the contract for a, for a copier from Dirks? No. no. From yeah. OPI. Okay. I'm sorry. We got too many things going on. From OPI. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Same sign. 2 1. Okay, thank you. Motion carried. Still not here. Can you go ahead with that? He actually does. I do. 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 That's what I was like. Lisa, do you have anything? I just wanted to show you guys something. Um, um, got the mailing now, tax statements out. Um, this is a list, you know, like I've explained before, they run all of our addresses through the national change of address first. So that simply gives them the chance to actually correct their tax statements and the address before they're mailed so we don't get a return. And so we have you know, 15 pages. And there's about, what, 12, 13 on each page. And then the bad addresses that they can't find which I, I had an obligation to mail them, even though I know some of them are bad addresses anyway. It's, it's my obligation for due diligence. So I, I just want to say we do a really good job on our addresses. And Postal Presort compliments us every year, because they say usually these address reports with bad addresses are hundreds of pages. So I thought I wanted to let you guys see how the process works. And so to, now we, I will go through now and change our database to the correct address that they've already got figured out for me. So that saves a lot of return mail, and that um, saves us having to pay um, the address service charge, which is 50 cents from the post office. So. It does, it's more efficient and it does save time. These are all bad addresses. These are addresses like where people have moved. And their postal pre-sort gave me the updated address. The tax statement actually went out changed. And then they gave me the correct addresses to change. So those are like people that moved during the year. And those would have all been return mail that we would have received. If we did it anyhow. Even the local post office wouldn't change it. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. No. So, so anyway, I just wanted to bring that down. And get payments already. So. They're due. <laughs> They're due, man. December 20th is for May 10th, the second half. If you do not have your personal property paid by December 20th, it's due in full on the 21st. Mm -hmm. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure that I'm going to go to the mail. It's like my birthday. It's like my birthday. I'm going to be here every three months. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Recess. Rob, you're in. Were you? Yeah, but I don't know what you said. I was sick, so I wasn't able to attend the last minute. Oh, I guess I was just dead. That's funny to catch up. I do know, we mentioned to you yesterday, they are 
that you have bids for poly tents that, that we discussed earlier. The one from the stone, Shaman. Shaman. I think they're still trying to get a bid there. It's in the ballpark of twenty-five hundred dollars to set for the large poly tanks. Uh, you know that. Um, also, we have some basically some older fire equipment that's actually one of the trucks that are they've had transmission problems. It's been here in St. John for whatever since it's been here. I mean, it's just like one in Maxville with a shell transmission and everything else. And something about it. It's a V8 Dodge. It's just not big enough uh, for what it needs. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we got rid of it. No, not yet. <laughs> I believe it's still on there. Yeah, it's still there. I'm still using it. Well, what I, I know one of the things that they discussed was there is a Ford F-250. It's kind of a responder vehicle that it was initially the Bolt error, is how I call it. Oh, yeah. And it was, yeah, and it was, as a first responder, basically it really didn't fit the purpose. I never thought it fit the purposes for what it needed to be. But they're wanting to possibly take off the back bed because we have the other truck that's in bad shape. They have to slip in unit for fire mm -hmm. and possibly using it as a fire. And this is just one little cut kind of, I don't have all the facts yet. Also, they were wanting to, and possibly they were checking bids to getting a replacement vehicle, a used one or something for. ALS response and firefighters, so they can still go back. That's what it's been used for, correct? Mm -hmm. All this time, but utilize that truck for what it's more what it's built for. Because being a 250 set heavy duty, it's kind of like you say, you need saddle tanks if you're going to be running calls for ALS. That way, mm -hmm. you can get more. They were checking the highway patrol for a used used vehicles, and they have Yukons. Such stuff with about sixty thousand miles on it for less than twenty thousand dollars. It's not a good dependable bid to the troopers. And possibly the, the possibility in the near future, before the end of the year, with the way funding is, to go ahead and purchase one with the money we still have after this year's operating expenses. Human printing emails. I said I was playing been um, playing catch up because yesterday was the first time I got to talk to him. We had some other things to discuss, but it's a little wait. Yeah, but it'll wait for. Yeah, the tanks and the truck was the tanks and two Irish members. Two main things that we wanted to do. Right. So you're waiting on another bid for the poly tank? They were trying to get another bid. I think we had two or three already. Um, we had several. I think Jim wanted that. He, they were waiting on the one from. They were trying to get the one from Shane's out of Wichita to see how comparable they were, but for. And I think he was going to get quotes on that replacement truck. For the or was we're working on some okay. from, to possibly replace right. the one that can take out of service. We have some that are just old, the longer we keep them, the more money it's going to cost to keep them up. And we're going to shovel vehicles around. And the ones that aren't the greatest vehicles in the world, so I'm still good serviceable ones, put them into the stations who basically don't have run responses hardly at all. And they're just as more like the radio sewer stations. And keep the better ones that are the point where we have a major response out of the three main towns that are here. That's still go all the way north and there. So you're wanting to do away with the Dodge truck, the one that keeps showing the transmission? Well, they actually have a transmission, but I think they want to put it into a station that doesn't have as many, oh, okay. as many right. runs and take the, the older unit up there because I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure. I don't go to both stations enough to know. The one of them has a slip in, what we call a slip in bed. It'll be a flat bed that basically can take off and it's a slip in fire tank and reels and hoses and everything else. And it can be put in the back in the main place of where the bed is on the truck already. And, make, and utilize it for, it's more designed for a fire than it is mm -hmm. ALS and stuff in that way, but also to help with the EMS because our firefighters and ALS, and ALS they have to run to get a replacement bit for more suited for those needs. And it could be still used for fire and bring personnel out or anything else, but it'd be more suited for ALS for us to other towns to assist them with the paramedics and so on. Besides just the escape. And, and so that being you're looking for to take the to do that job is from the 
surplus, Kansas surplus? That's motorboat. where we're looking at now because the price we have on them and their used vehicles, but the service upkeep has been yeah. good on them. And a lot of the a lot of the communities get their used police vehicles through them. They get their handy down charges. You said it still came with some warranty. It still came with, I yesterday. believe, the rest of the 100,000 mile warranty That's on it. It comes with a light bar, siren package, some Sorry, of the things that are already. So basically, one or two radios you can throw in, it could be actually the service door if you go on the road. Sounds like a pretty good deal. So you're wanting us to say proceed or? Well, we already, already discussed the, the liners. We were just sort of basically letting you know about right. those, where we're standing at from our meeting with that once a month that we were coming and let you know where we're standing at. That's, that's what we're mm -hmm. doing. Good. And also that what we're looking for in the future. And so it's not a shock where we come in and say we definitely wanted to take care of move these vehicles around, take some of these off of our service fleet and add another one. They got room on their budget. Come. Fire budget for everything. Yeah, I think it's in pretty good shape. Yeah, probably right from yeah. last month. And the vehicle, the surplus vehicle you want to purchase, would that come out of the fire budget or would that come out of EMS yeah. or would that come out? Of we didn't know. I don't know what EMS's budget is or anything else. EMS, like that. I mean, the escape is coming out of it. Um, so yeah. they were thinking because the fire truck or the truck is being utilized more fire than it is EMS, they were wanting to utilize that fire truck and just replace the just unit. Replace the yeah. Basically, and, and the vehicle still being used EMS and fire also. And they basically, like, places it, they can take it. It's still it's used meetings. dual purposes that way. In your capital outlay for fire, um, you have basically twenty nine thousand to spend on vehicles. But he's got budget. What are you saying? Sixteen thousand or nineteen thousand? I believe we're nineteen thousand. Okay. So yeah, they would be fine. Just for purchasing it out of fire. Go, and then you and then switch out. You say move vehicles where they're not. It's it's still a serviceable vehicle, but it's like I say, it's shell so many transmissions. I don't know, probably four in its career or what. With the low mileage it's got anyway, just put it in the station because it's easy to scratch. Yeah, is there a big load on there? Yeah, it's Basically, that's what it is. It's, it's those V8 one ton Dodges. Uh, we have one in Massville, but it's a standard. There's some of that. Ours hold the shells and clutches. But we finally have got that fixed in it over the years and see it is. But the automatic you know, just it's just too much weight mm -hmm. against for what it's. But the 250 would probably hold up a little bit better. And, and basically, it'll just be strictly by your body. You won't have a lot of extra gear on it because it can carry on the other trucks that are bigger. It'll have 10 you know, express fire. Yeah. So, you need to do the motion now for all that stuff, or you want to wait until you get. Hmm. I would we wait until wait we, get we have definite deals. deals. We were just, yeah. we're just keeping you informed okay. of what is going on. That you asked for, and possible things in the future before the end year that we're trying to look into and get done, possibly this year's budget. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I think, from what I remember yesterday, that's pretty well. He was talking about that. Here you come. <laughs> <laughs> We're wanting to discuss an executive session. He's here now. Whatever has gone wrong this morning, possibly go wrong past. Yeah, it's a good day for Welcome to our meeting. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> um, I actually have another one. Jerry Sanders just called me. Did it. And I'm going to set up for Okay. There's going to be one from Shaven Industry. It's going to be for 2100 bucks. So, and that's a Newton. So I think they'll deliver it to Newton, and uh, Jerry Wolford or something else will get it. Up, so. That works for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> they won't wait for you. And this is a tank for what? Uh, one of the five-ton trucks that we purchased. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
We purchased a tank that uh, didn't meet the specifications is what the chief wanted. He wanted a bigger tank. We purchased a 1,600 gallon tank. And we've got an 800 gallon ice cube, ice chest tank on the Mellon Hudson, so we're going to be able to take that tank and utilize it and put it on the other truck. This one's how many? 2,600 gallon. Because we're limited on some of the, the forestry trucks, but not for ice. So we need to. 2100 bucks, you say? Yeah. Even? yeah. That's what Jerry told me. Is it a motion to do that? Either? Yeah. I make a motion to allow the fire department to purchase a tank from Shaden and those shoes for $2,100. Second. And then second, we accept a bid from Shaden Tank Company for $2,100 for a 2,600 gallon poly tank. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. 2100 Shaven Industries. Yeah, I had an email. S C H A V E N. S C H A V E N. Yeah, I just got the email just as I walked in the door on the on the pickup house on the top. So, um, this contact information for all of us, all the fire chiefs and Ken, phone numbers and our email addresses. So, if you would happen to need to get contact with us. Call the one at the top first. Yeah, call Rob. Rob, Rob okay. is the catch all guy. He and the star by his name. <laughs> and then you can just work your way down the list okay. if you have to. So. Okay, got it. So, um, other than that, uh, okay. he, did, he, did, he, did, he did get an email, if I could say, on the HP, so we have a better idea on that, the pricing. Just yes, kind of take one of the other. Just a little bit of light on that, too. The secondary is going to be a secondary ALS response because we're using the escape yeah. right now as primary, and this will just be a secondary backup. Just like the, the EMS just, just like the big one is, yeah, it's going to be a secondary. So yeah. basically, you're just going to swap the ALS. Yeah, and we'll, and, we'll, yeah, yeah. and both departments will still have access to it for whatever as needed. But um, this big would be better equipped for the running around, the smaller running around. Than that. They have a um, 2008 Chevy Silverado pickup that has 72,140 miles on it. KHB is asking for $10,000 for it. NAD value on it is 20000 And they have white Tahoes with 69,000 miles and push bumpers. Those were previously canine units. So a 2011 model would be $18,000. A 2012 model would be $18,500. Um, there's a couple add-on things that we can do that will save us money in the long run. Um, that comes with siren systems, speaker, amplifier, PA mic, and light switches for an extra $400, and also an LED light bar for an extra $400. So that would limit us. All we'd have to do is buy a couple of radios, a couple of antennas, mount them, and it's good to have. it'd be in service. So, and there's a console that would be no charge. They also have a push bumper that's on them. And it says, well, it says LED lights on push bumper, top of only 200 bucks. Uh, LED lights on push bumper. So, as far as I can see, we really don't need a push bumper for, for what we're going to do. It's going to be used as an ALS. And if we all need to go to train or something like that, we need to have extra personnel, we can do that. So, but that's two from KHB. That was the last truck that they have is a white. Silverado, they were uh, getting ready to auction it off, and I think just it's a half ton. I'm assuming half ton is a little drive. The other ones are the the other ones are two. They're two over. It's a road reaction. It will not be a firefighting right. deal. Just be delivering personnel equipment out to us if we need to. The ALS respond. You know, the good thing about the Tahoe is that you're already heavy duty alternator, the AC. You're getting all the heavy duty stuff on police back mm -hmm. just like what we get on ours. So. The, the only other added expense, I, I talked with Tom, is these Tahoe's are high rated speed. We want to lower it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for anybody to get into, we don't want the 130 mile an hour. Yeah, it, it, it tops out at 125 miles an hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just so too much of a vehicle. I mean, that's well, something we can adjust. What would come off a lot. And so there might be an added expense to get a chip to get it lowered just for safety. Yeah, we're, we're trained to drive. drive. We have to drive that way, but yeah. not everybody can get behind the wheel and have to drive. I don't know how to drive that way. For safety reasons, we don't want to do that. 
Yeah. Is that the Tahoe is a pickup or is it? It is a, a, it's a sport utility vehicle. Excuse me. And you can haul more people. It'll be more people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a four versus, versus the pickup. Versus the pickup. I, I simply asked about a pickup because I knew that they were phasing pickups out. Mm -hmm. uh, KHB is pretty well went to all sport utility vehicles for, for truck troopers and canine officers. The mileage on the pickup was 72,140. I think all the ones in the K9 ones is weight majors. So it was a truck truck truck. It's four-wheel drive. It's two. Yeah. Uh, the pickup, I'm assuming, is four-wheel drive. I thought it was two-wheel. But two -wheel. I'm assuming he didn't really hit on that this morning. This so there's decals and stuff on them? We'll have to put these. They're, they're completely I mean, stripped. They're stripped on. Me yeah, ex except for the light bars. So we would, if we would do it. are extra. A yeah, little extra, but four hundred dollars for the light bar and four hundred dollars for the uh, eight hundred dollars. So eight hundred dollars extra is what we're looking. That would give us the light bar, or the siren pack. That 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 eight hundred dollars doesn't even cover a light bar. A brand new light bar. Those are sixteen hundred on that. Depending on what you want, you can get cheaper, but you get a cheaper light bar. Version. Light bar and the uh, siren box, switch box, the amplifier, all all, all the bells and whistles. So it would be 800 total position. And it would be. Um, we can kind of wait till next month if you want me to explore some other options. You want me to look at some different vehicles. It's whatever you want to do. That's 2011, 2012. Yeah, 2011, 2012. The 11 was 18 and the 12. 12 was 18, 5. No, and, and that's the good thing is that KHP, I mean, they're all taken care of. How's the tires? <laughs> I haven't checked yet, but no one, no one KHP is. Seems like we have an issue about tires. Yeah. <laughs> no one KHP about things. I, I know people all went through the and shop. And it still has a remainder of 100,000. I can get a little bit more details and I can bring this back to you next week. Say, or or next week. If, if well, you just want to see that, we can give it to you faster than you do next week. Of course, it would hurt to check on other stores. Okay. But that in reserve. But you don't want these to be killed. No, yeah. and. Are they going to be gone by next week? No, I don't know. It changes weekly up there. I know. Yeah. Uh, I don't say for I know the city up there, Max, they'll work checking. That surplus is going to be decent. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'd be the 12 mile. It would still be about 93. 193. I'd say go ahead. I'd make a motion. Purchase that vehicle in the interest, best interest of the fire or the county. If they can find a better deal, we will not purchase it. I did do some shopping on a few of the uh, like armies and dunes. Right. I don't think you'll find that. that close. Yeah, they don't have anything. <laughs> We're talking 24 to 34,000 for a yeah. uh, pickup that that's older. It's been moved and seconded that we purchased a 2012 Tahoe from the Kansas Highway Patrol for $19,300. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. What he said. In the best I'm interest of sure. the county, if they can find a better deal, then go with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about vehicles moving around. Um, <laughs> yeah, what we're going to do with the pickups, the two pickups, we'll be selling that, uh, what was it, 80? Four mile. Uh, it's 
Yeah, there's a 1984 Ford brush in the vehicle. What we sell on that 84 Ford brush truck once we get a strip and turn it around. And if it's anything like the 80 model, I think the 80 model brought by 52, 5300 yeah. yeah. <laughs> And this one's in a little bit better shape. But uh, this has a sliding bed, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, no, it's, it's, it's got a flat well, on it. Well, 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 I believe it's just, uh, the 1980. Yeah, I, you've got the master copy of all my chicken scratch of truck numbers on it, so <laughs> it's a lot to get. Oh, okay. But uh, we will be doing that in, in the near future. We get this one taken care of. And, We'll uh, start working. We're going to have to probably purchase the flatbed from probably Sunflower for the uh, the pickup. Which, but the unit goes into sliding. Right? Sliding unit. Yeah, I mean, so we skid steer, slide it in, and basically it has to fit in somewhere. With, with, with the replacement vehicle, at, say, just to go ahead and call it twenty thousand dollars. I'm not sure what the flatbeds are running nowadays. There are a couple thousand at least. But the outfitted truck, we're talking forty five, fifty thousand dollars and we're getting for less than twenty five. Mm -hmm. so and that's what the replacement vehicle. Coming out my head, we're gaining another we're gaining another brush rate that we desperately need at this department. Especially at St. John's because they are gaining people that are responsible for us. And so it's a really limited situation we can. The other thing, I, and we brought it up at Chiefs meeting the other night, you know, we had the unfortunate incident last Tuesday night with the town of the ice, and I uh, praised Jerry Sanders Station and Stafford EMS very, very highly. They got out there. That was worst case scenario that you can ever deal with on the highway with the weather conditions and what happened, and they done an excellent job of rerouting traffic and controlling things. I think KDOT showed up. Uh, one kid out truck showed up 15 minutes before we get into the center. So, and they were notified at the beginning. Uh, I mean, just as soon as we were in route, they were notified because we needed to be Two and a half hours, one showed up. Uh, excellent, excellent job. I mean, everybody worked together. We had just a couple of headaches of rerouting traffic. We had a muddy road, but we had to deal with it. Everything went yes, just well. Is this the one so, that got Cape News all excited? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So. They are uh, dealing with that still. So I would request a uh, 10 minute executive session to discuss how much the personnel. executive session. Tom, Rob, you need me for that? Yeah, yeah you might have to sit back, Joe. Let's hear the table on Joe. Yep. I'll start with that. All right. We're going to have 10 minute executive Safety session to discuss non elected personnel while I'm here saying aye. 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 Motion carried 10 minutes. Good. Some of this kind of the, the history of this maybe predates the, the commission, but the way the economic development is set up, there is membership and then there's a board of directors, maybe something similar to co op. Um, it was the way that there, I guess, compromise was established that gave commissioners continuing involvement in economic development, but also the needed separation for it to be the nonprofit. So your members. Um, by our bylaws, we have an annual meeting at least once a year to elect officers, and must be done by December 31st. That's so coming up. Um, we, the that board met this morning. It's just regular monthly meeting, and. Uh, decided that with this with the December schedule that having it at our regular scheduled time was going to work best for everyone. So it's going to sound like we're having it at an inconvenient time on purpose, but it's not on purpose. <laughs> we're letting you know that the uh, annual meeting is at 7 a.m. <laughs> the time that on the second Wednesday, 7 a.m. on the second Wednesday is the regular meeting time. But 7 a.m. on December 11th. Um, it'll be the, the annual meeting for the organization and really the main thing that makes it an annual meeting is that it is what our will elect the officers for the, the coming year. So, you're welcome to come and vote. <laughs> it's a formal notice that we must give in writing or in person, so that's all I think. Okay. We've talked a little bit about trying to adjust the time of year. Um, we would have a, another annual meeting 
into the spring of the year and get us onto a cycle where you can look at year end financials and so forth. It might also be a little more convenient for holiday schedules, but if you have an opinion on that, that's expressive. <laughs> Yes, I do. Okay. I was digging through my desk and found my message to call you okay. from a week ago. Okay. <laughs> and I apologize, but I'll, uh, I'm going to call here this afternoon. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Oh. No. Yeah. We're adjourned.